around education justice and, and youth justice. So for the grantee partners on the call, we really look forward to the board members. We really look forward to seeing you there. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me, Manuel. I'm going to pass it back to you. Um, I look forward to learning with everybody. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. Um, we are super excited to be in the warmth of your company. We are literally experiencing a thunderstorm here in New York City, and it's one big, gloomy, gray cloud, and your smiles are definitely the sunshine of the day. So, um, as Leticia mentioned, this is our fourth learning session. The first few were on a number of different topics. Um, uh, uh, career pathways and employment opportunities affecting youth um, ages 16 to 24 impacted by the justice, foster care, and other disruptive systems. That's the population that the Andrews Family Fund funding supports and lifts up. Um, we've covered a number of issues, and today what we'll, we'll be doing is focusing specifically on LGBTQ youth. Um, and really the learning will be happening vis-a-vis -vis our grantee partners and our fellow funders and other really important um, ally organizations in the field. And so I just want to set the context really quickly and tell you a little bit about the goals of the session um, and then the flow of the session and then we'll get started. But primarily the sessions are meant to lift up the work of our partners to learn a little bit about the strategies and best practices that they're engaged in, um, and also what they're identifying as challenges as well as opportunities. Um, it's to help facilitate conversation and relationships between uh, organizations on the ground doing the work and funders as well. Uh, this is really a virtual dialogue space, a virtual learning space, so we're very glad you could be a part of it today. Um, just wanted to signal a couple of things that are opportunities for continued learning. If you want to continue to stay connected to the Andrews Family Fund, we have um, a podcast and we have a blog on our website. We are also constantly tweeting about the great work that's happening in the field around young people impacted by the justice and foster care system. So you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and all these wonderful social media handles. Um, we will be having a webinar that is another learning opportunity prior to having our grantee convening in San Juan, Puerto Rico this coming October. We are co-organizing Education and New Shifting Justice 2018 with our partners, Communities for Just and Fair Schools Fund. Uh, the learning webinar will be on September 26th at 2.30. Reach out to Jennifer Kaiser um, here at the fund if you'd like to RSVP and be a part of the learning that's happening there. Um, and uh, for those of you who are AFF grantee partners, we can't wait to see you in Puerto Rico. So don't forget to register. Great. So the goals of today's session really are to lift up um, why we're focusing to begin with on uh, the young people in the justice and foster care system that are LGBTQ. According to the Federal Bureau of uh, Justice Statistics, although uh, LGBTQ youth only make up between 7 and 9%, of all youth involved in the, just, in the criminal justice system, there are actually about 20% of those inside juvenile justice facilities. And when we break that uh, population out, LGBTQ girls are close to 40% of all uh, girls involved or, or incarcerated in juvenile justice facilities. So that is a huge number of the girls that are currently in justice facilities. And then when you look at that even further, you'll find that of all of the LGBTQ and gender non-conforming youth involved in the justice system, 85% of them are youth of color. So we have to ask ourselves a question, why are LGBTQ youth, and in particular youth of color, overrepresented in the justice system and in justice facilities to begin with? They are also overrepresented in child welfare systems. And so we know that young people are facing, in addition to a myriad of discrimination and bias, um, they also face lack of support. They're at higher risk for violence from families and child welfare pl placements, and sometimes other young people in the system. Um, homeless youth in particular are uh, facing substantial challenges, including the risk of engaging in dangerous activities um, just for survival, anything from treating sex for food or shelter, drugs, shoplifting, and really just the dangers of being a young person that's not being supported and doesn't have um, the connections that they need to uh, be in a safe school, to be in a safe family, et cetera. And so we know that there are some challenges, but we also are really excited about the 
meaningful, really powerful work of our partners on the call today to see if they'd like to share a little bit about what are also the opportunities on the horizon. And so today what we'll be doing is all of the panelists will introduce their work, a little bit about their organizations, and then we will have a round robin conversation um, around the challenges and opportunities that they are aware of and explore ways that potentially your fund or your organization can get involved and support further. And finally, we'll open it up to a Q&A by all the folks on the line. So without further ado, we'd love to start with Alexandra, who's coming from the Center for Study on Social Policy. She's a policy analyst with them. Alexandra, welcome. And I would love to turn uh, the mic over to you, Alexandra, to see if you can tell us a little bit about the work of the Center for the Study of Social Policy, as well as potentially provide us an overview of the child welfare system and how it has, um, what, are, what is the legislation at the federal level that you feel really impacts LGBTQ young people um, and anything else you would like to share with us about the federal landscape. So welcome, Alexandra. Great. Great. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, as, I, as I get started, um, I just want to share a little bit about CSSC, who we are, sort of how we do the work, um, and as Manuela said, uh, what we can expect as some challenges and opportunities that we're currently seeing. Um, is, the, is my PowerPoint available? Is that showing? Yeah, um, yes, Jen is sharing it. There we go. Okay. Great, there, there we go. Um, just wanted to make sure that I wasn't rushing through. So um, as we mentioned, uh, Center for the Study of Social Policy, also known as CSSP, um, we're located in uh, DC, although we do have a small New York office. So the storm that was currently, that was outside the DC office yesterday is now outside our New York office. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Great. So what, what do we do here at CSSC? So we, uh, I also want to just add that equity is really central to our goals and values here. Um, it's how we do the work. It's, we, it's how we believe the work should be done. So no piece of our work um, is done without thinking about equity at the core. So with that, what do we do here? So we work uh, to reform systems to be better able to serve uh, children and families that are often disproportionately impacted and have disparate outcomes. Uh, we also promote policies that uh, lead with equity. So specific to our work around LGBTQ+, plus, uh, we do a lot of policy and adv ad advocacy and education, um, and we have what's called, uh, what we call our Get Real Initiative, where real stands for recognize, engage, affirm, and love. Um, and our Get Real Initiative is currently, we're currently working in Allegheny County in Pennsylvania. Um, and in California, and we also convene a group of our Get Real Networks who are working to advance the healthy sexual and adolescent development of youth who are in the child welfare system. Um, we also have a number of other uh, initiatives that focus on uh, institutional racism in both uh, the child welfare and juvenile justice uh, system. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that's uh, unique about our approach here, and, and I set, use this as to sort of set the stage for how we get to our recommendations, is that we really combine uh, our analysis and assessment of policy along with practice, um, as well as voices and the experiences of communities. Um, so as far as the practice piece, again, um, our Get Real initiative works in uh, a couple of different places, so we're doing direct hands-on work there. Um, the policy work, we're uh, constantly thinking about the interpretation and application of policy uh, in this space. So how policies may have um, unintended consequences for uh, children and families of color or those who identify um, as LGBTQ. Um, we also know that some of those policies do have intended consequences, so being outspoken about that as well. And in terms of communities, really thinking about lifting up the lived experiences um, and we were fortunate enough a couple of years ago to uh, conduct focus groups across the country with LGBTQ youth of color um, through uh, support from Andrus, um, which was a, an amazing experience and we learned so much and we've been able to use that information in uh, developing 
Um, many of these uh, pieces here that you see, uh, these are all pieces that you can find on our website um, that include recommendations uh, for how to move them forward. So next slide, please. So to just share a little bit about the current landscape. Um, what we know of the data uh, from, this is from one study, is that 22.8% of young people in out-of-home care identify as LGBTQ, and 50% of these young people are young people of color. Um, I will say that this is data from one study. We do not currently have national data here, um, which is a real challenge uh, that I will put a pin in for um, in, a, in a moment, but a very big challenge that we have. Um, we also know, though, through research that LGBTQ plus youth are uh, disproportionately placed in congregate care, so in group homes, uh, group settings, and not in uh, family-based uh, foster homes. In terms of what we're seeing at the policy level, we are seeing these religious refusal laws. Um, there are 10 states, at least as of, as of this very moment, uh, that could change any moment though, um, that have what we're calling religious refusal laws specifically directed at child welfare. So, um, and uh, this is also having other discriminatory policies. So not placing kids based on their um, gender identity, um, refusing to work with uh, work with foster parents who identify as you were across the spectrum, um, not providing uh, health care and uh, access to other services that um, kids in care need because of how they identify. On the plus side, there are some real positive things happening. Uh, we know that there are states that are taking a stand against this. So Pennsylvania is uh, a good example of that. Uh, you know, they had a family foster uh, care provider who um, said that they were not going to serve uh, LGBTQ prospective adoptive and foster parents. Um, and the state recognized not only is that a problem on many levels, but it also for those parents and for building a broader uh, foster home, continuum of foster home resources. But they also recognize the statement that that made to LGBT kids who are currently in care, right? That these, these, uh, this uh, provider was not affirming of potential foster parents, but also not affirming of kids who they were responsible for promoting their, their well being and healthy development. Uh, so Pennsylvania took back that contract, um, and there has been some some real uh, changes and shifts there as a result. So that's a really positive thing. And there are also a number of states that are implementing policies that affirm a child or youth SOGI um, policies that say they are going to place based on gender identity, um, and may, really making that explicit. Um, banning uh, conversion therapy, making that explicit. So we've seen some movement in places like. New York and Vermont and uh, Pennsylvania, but we've also seen movement in states like Tennessee that just enacted um, a really positive and affirming uh, policy. So it's nice to see, and it's important that we're seeing these policies pop up across the country. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna also make sure that we're grounding all of what I've talked about from sort of the policy landscape and the experiences of youth. So, these are all direct quotes from the focus groups that we conducted, um, and I'll, I'll read a, a couple of them. So, I think it would have helped me if I would have known that my foster mom or foster dad were okay with my sexuality. I never knew if I could disclose it, and I never did. And I think that's where I and and I think that's where I think a lot of my outlashing, my attitude, my anger, my depression, and my rebellion came from. It felt like nobody understood me. Another quote that has really resonated with me, especially when I heard it in person, um, I, would I would always have a butcher knife inside under my pillow because I didn't trust people. I always felt that someone was going to try to attack me. So the only way I felt safe was with weapons. Um, as I'm sure folks on this, uh, this learning uh, session know, these are not sort of unique quotes, right? Um, these are the experiences that we heard about um, across the country, um, overwhelming concerns about safety and placement and in the community, um, youth not feeling affirmed or that there was a safe space to talk about SOGI identity um, and development, um, and a lot of behaviors that were characterized as mental health illness and often over prescription of psychotropic drugs for these youth when really 
you know, if as as this one you said, right, I just needed to be affirmed in my identity and feel supported in that. Um, we also heard a lot about over surveillance and placements. You've had a set of different rules from their heterosexual and cisgender peers. So next slide, please. So moving forward, where do we go from here? So there are quite a few opportunities and challenges moving forward, um, and we have put these in some buckets, federal policy, state and local policy, system reform, and practice change. Um, I will also note that there's a lot of folks doing um, organizing uh, and youth advocacy work. That is another opportunity um, and avenue for change. It's, it's not one at CSSP that we're as deeply rooted in, which is why I've, we've highlighted the other ones here. So starting with opportunities and challenges uh, at the federal level, um, as folks know, uh, probably know, the Family, uh, Family First Prevention Services Act was passed earlier this year, um, and it completely changes the way how child welfare financing works. Um, it will completely rewrite child welfare as we know it, both in terms of the opportunities within funding prevention services at the front end of the system, but also in terms of how it'll fund foster homes and incentivize states to place youth in family-based foster homes rather than in congregate care. As far as the in foster care uh, piece here, there's a risk um, and an opportunity. So states will be required to move kids out of uh, congregate care group home settings and place them in foster homes. And when kids come in, they'll need to be placed in family foster homes. If a child does need a higher level of, stand of care in what they're now calling these qualified residential treatment programs, there will need to be an assessment, a proper assessment um, done to make sure that that child is placed appropriately. So there's a real opportunity here for states to uh, recruit and work on retaining affirming foster homes that can support LGBTQ youth who come into care. But we're also worried that if states do not do this upfront up front work of um, recruitment and retention, what may happen um, is that you're going to have is that states will have LGBTQ youth, um, particularly LGBTQ youth of color, who are disproportionately in uh, congregate care settings and who remain in congregate care. Um, as states work to move kids out of congregate care, it's, it's going to be no surprise that it's easier to move um, a baby or a two-year-old or, or a three-year-old from a group home to a family foster home, right? That's, that's part of every child welfare system's experience. They would say, oh, it's much easier to place a baby, right, than to place a teenager. So they're going to move the, the baby first, then they'll move the young kids. And what we're afraid of is actually that this disproportionality will get worse and you'll have actually more LGBTQ youth of color in particular who are disproportionately placed in congregate care if states are not building up the continuum of uh, foster homes to affirm and to be affirming, but also aren't thinking about how do they support youth and their healthy uh, sexual identity development um, throughout the course of uh, their time in foster care, right? So that some of these actions and these behaviors that youth were telling us were really manifestations of not being affirmed aren't treated as uh, mental health issues that are then over, these are then over prescribed medications. So that's a, that's a big opportunity um, and challenge there. Um, as I mentioned, I would come back to the data point. So the AFCARS uh, is the data system that states report into. Um, there had been a final rule published to include collection of data around SOGI. That is now being revisited. Comment, there will be a new comment period in um, April, May, we're expecting, so folks should uh, be on the lookout for that. There's also a QIC focused on LGBTQ youth and involved in child welfare, so there's a lot coming out of there as well as a good opportunity. At the state local and local levels, I've already mentioned, there's some of these religious refusal laws, which are a big challenge, but also opportunities um, and positive examples of states implementing affirming policies. In terms of system reform and practice change, there's really a lot of uh, opportunity here to work on workforce training, coaching, and putting in accountability measures for the workforce so that they are, um, that they understand how they can be affirming and what that means to be affirming and to be practicing in an affirming way. Um, there are also some states that have gone on their own, including Allegheny County in Pennsylvania and in California, in collecting SOGI data. So even though it's not happening at the federal level, there are some states that are doing that themselves. So. Um, those are just a couple of the opportunities and challenges moving forward, and I will I will stop there. Don't want to go too much over time.
Thank you so much, Alexandra. As you can see her emails on the uh, PowerPoint, feel free to take that down. And at the end, we'll share these all uh, again for you to learn more about their organization. Um, so Chris, I wanna turn to you to see if you can tell us a little bit about the work of the Transgender Law Center and maybe just situate us historically on where we are at at this moment in terms of how our nation is um, relating to uh, trans communities in particular and the types of um, attacks and criminalization that uh, trans communities are facing. Great. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. It's really good to be here with folks. Um, I, I did have a PowerPoint if it's possible to pull it up, um, but I'll, I'll just get us going. So. Uh, my name is Chris Hayashi. I'm the executive director at the Transgender Law Center. Uh, we are the largest national trans-led organization in the country, advocating for self-determination for all people. We use a wide range of community-driven strategies to keep trans and gender non-conforming people alive, thriving, and fighting for our rights and our communities. Um, so that means we do a mix of impact litigation, policy advocacy, uh, public education, movement building, and leadership development. Our, we're headquartered in Oakland, California, um, but we also have an office, a southern regional office in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, um, and then uh, very, as of very recently, an office in New York City. Um, I, I think there's a problem with my PowerPoint, but you know what, I don't really need it, if, if that's okay. Um, I can just talk. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I wanted to start out just by giving a sense of kind of the, the broader context of the trans movement um, and my community. So, you know, we've been in this moment uh, over the last five years or so where we've had this incredible increase in visibility in terms of popular me media and culture. Uh, however, the reality of that visibility is that it does not equal safety. Um, it does not equal justice for trans communities ac across the country. The majority of trans people, the majority of trans people of color are struggling to survive on a daily basis. So we face four times the poverty rate. Um, I believe the statistic is that uh, nearly 80% of trans and gender nonconforming uh, young people um, are uh, uh, face harassment in, in schools uh, to the extent where one sixth actually end up being pushed out of school. Um, nearly half of black trans and gender non-conforming people have experienced incarceration. Um, and three out of five transgender women in men's prisons report being sexually assaulted while incarcerated. Um, so, you know, the, the overall conditions for trans people in this country, particularly trans people of color, is that people are just facing tremendous violence, harassment, and discrimination. And so, you know, one, one quick story to tell, uh, there is a young black transgender woman in Colorado, her name is uh, Lindsay Saunders, and she uh, previously had been held in a, a juvenile correction facility in Colorado for females. Um, when she turned 18, she was transferred to a men's prison um, and did everything that she could to fight that along with her lawyer, um, but she was transferred to a men's prison. Um, that is where she is now. Unfortunately, she was sexually assaulted multiple times there. Um, these are the types of conditions that transgender young people, um, transgender people in this country are facing. And, I know there is a couple folks on the line um, who are from some incredible grassroots organizing groups across the country who I know will also speak to this. But um, you know, we are we are as a community, uh, we are not new to violence and to death of our folks, and we're in a moment right now where uh, every year has been the most reported murders of transgender people in this country, of which the majority are black and brown trans women, and uh, we, in the last two weeks, lost four uh, young, young black trans women to murder in this country. And just yesterday learned of a trans Latina who was killed um, on the border. So the, the broader kind of context and reality for trans people in this country is that we are overall struggling to survive on a daily basis. Um, if folks can move to the next slide. 
So, so on top of that, over the last, uh, I would say, three or four years, we've seen an incredible uh, amount of right-wing backlash. And so that has come primarily in the form of these uh, kind of so-called bathroom bills. So they first started popping up in 2015. And so these bills ultimately are about criminalizing transgender people for simply using the bathroom, about criminalizing transgender people for simply trying to go about our days and our lives. Um, and so they started in 2015. In 2016, we just faced an onslaught. Um, it was a level of anti-trans legislative attack that we had not faced before as a movement and community. Um, and attempts to pass these types of bills have continued to these days. And the reality is that the majority of this legislation actually targeted transgender young people. It was actually about schools, which means that for transgender young people in those states, they were facing an onslaught of anti-trans propaganda that was about themselves and their lives. So clearly having huge impact on their wellness, their health, um, their ability to even stay in school, right? So resulting in many transgender young people being pushed out of school, many transgender young people end up in survival in economies and in incarceration. Um, and then, you know, just to note, uh, we've in this year, different than in previous years, seen attempts to put uh, anti-trans legislation, so these types of bathroom bills on the ballot. So actually putting our rights as transgender people um, up for public vote. So, so far it's been, un they've been unsuccessful. However, this coming November in Massachusetts, um, for, there will be, for the first time, a uh, vote on a statewide ballot initiative um, around the rights of transgender people. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So, so all that was true, right, in terms of the, the reality of the conditions that transgender people have and continue to face, the onslaught of anti-trans legislation in the form of bathroom bills, and then, uh, then Trump was elected, right? And what we have experienced and what we have seen um, under the current administration is a strategic and relentless attempt to deny the very humanity and existence of transgender people in this country. And one of the first things that uh, Trump did after he was inaugurated was he rescinded, rescinded Department of Education and Department of Justice guidance to protect transgender students from discrimination. So again, the types of ways in which transgender students are being harassed and facing discrimination in schools, like being a clear pipeline to prisons, to juvenile facilities, um, and industry economies. So since then, right, since that first kind of rollback, um, we've seen rollback after rollback of the rights of transgender people. And again, some of it specifically targeting transgender young people. So at this point, from the CDC issuing a list of banned words that included transgender, from the military ban, um, from we know that the Department of Education um, and the Department of Justice are actually refusing to hear cases of transgender students who are facing discrimination. So we are in a moment where we are just experience a, experiencing a very, very clear um, and targeted attempt to roll back the rights of transgender people in this country, along with so many other communities being targeted from communities of color, black folks, women, immigrants, Muslims. Um, it's just a, a very clear and intentional attempt, attempt to deny the humanity of, of so many people in this country. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So, you know, I'll, I'll just say in terms of, of what opportunity looks like in this moment, um, you know, we are very clear that trans and gender non-conforming people all across this country that we have always organized, we have always fought for our rights, we have always done what we need to build community and to keep each other safe. And that more so than ever before, we need to ground in um, that history to ground in the current leadership of so many people across the country. We are very clear that in this moment for transgender people, um, our resilience is resistance. Um, and so there are, there are mo so many fronts on which that is happening. Um, one way you know, for us at TLC is definitely in the courts. Um, you know, the litigation has definitely been a way in which 
We have continued to fight back under this current administration um, in terms of fighting back against uh, some of the attempts to deny transgender students their ability to um, even live their lives and go to school. Um, from cases that I've mentioned before of uh, transgender young people um, in juvenile facilities or in prison facing horrible violence and harassment. Um, and I will say that the, the other opportunity, and I won't go, go too much in depth to this, uh, because I know there are folks on this call who can speak uh, much more to it, is that there are just so many leaders all across the country, um, grassroots organizers who are, have been and continue to work with very, very little access to resources and support. Um, that has been true for many, many years and continues to be true, but are the folks who are really at the front lines in fighting back against the attacks that have been happening, continue to happen, and really are about keeping our, our folks in community safe. And so two quick examples of that. Um, just uh, this past week, TLC, along with many other folks across the country, um, sought to raise visibility um, and public consciousness around the murders of black trans women that have happened, um, continue to happen, and then the four that happened within a two week period, um, just in the last few weeks, through a national moment of silence and action, um, time for black trans women, which is just one, one small intervention um, in, in many, many more interventions that need to happen if we really want to address the violence uh, that black trans women that our communities are facing. Um, and then a couple weeks ago, there was a gathering of uh, LGBT immigrant rights leaders in Albuquerque to particularly address the types of uh, ways in which immigrants are being targeted, that in which young um, trans and LGBT immigrants are being targeted in this moment. So even in this moment of intense attack um, under this new administration, there are clear ways in which as a community, the folks who are being most targeted in this moment are coming together um, to advance strategy, to build community, and to continue to move forward our movements. So I'll just close with that. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your um, great work at the Transgender Law Center. I would love to turn to um, take Daranisha and Mahogany to hear a little bit about um, the work that TAKE does, in particular, Daranisha and Mahogany, your reflections on what is it like to be a trans young person in the South and what are some of the particular challenges facing trans uh, young women in your area related to health, related to social services, access to education and reentry. Um, as well as, Dharanish, if you could provide some of your reflections on what are some of the challenges facing uh, extremely under-resourced organizations taking on so much of the holistic supports that our young people need. So thank you for being on the call with us and feel free to share. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm Dharanisha Duncan Board, the founder and executive director of Take Resource Center here in Birmingham. TAKE stands for Transgenders, Advocates, Knowledgeable, and Empowering. And the reason why I founded the Resource Center over five years ago is basically to provide a one-stop shop for trans women of color to be able to have a home, to feel safe. Of course, I'll piggyback off what Chris said. Um, the numbers are extremely high this year, and we say that every year as we keep looking at the murder rate. Right? Now we're looking at it's a total of 15 um, African-American transgender people that have been killed. 14 to be exact are female, one trans male, um, three Latina trans women, and the other four are non-people of color. So we see that the services that we're doing in community is very critical. And when I thought about adding to the program, our re-entry side was what does, um, society looks like for folks that are aging out of the welfare system and also um, coming as formal incarcerated people, what does that look like? Um, trying to um, move them away from the institution thinking and just giving them a fair chance to be able 
um, to operate in societies without having a radar on their head, um, basically, saying that we know that we're already facing challenges as being trans, and then you add being a person of color, black on top of it, it doesn't make things even um, better. So um, our reentry program is basically working with the municipal court here, um, saying that um, we have some type of protocol that's in place um, where it's basically a diversion program. If they come there, they identify as um, a trans woman of color, we automatically will go there, um, get them out for free of charge. They'll be released to take to do some form of community service and also will be um, connected with a the therapist to do some psychosocial um, therapy working around depends on what the charge is. Just say, for instance, if it's a lady that's um, caught doing sex work. We try to find out the reason why she's doing sex work, which we all know the reason why she's doing sex work, but we can't go in there telling the judges that, you know, oh, we promote sex work, you know, that we got to let the folks do it, but we have to get the judges to believe what we're doing is right, and which we're going to know what to do for our community by getting these ladies out, encourage them to, you know, practice safe sex, but giving them other options and trying to find different traits and things things to help them do better. Um, also, um, with the um, reentry around the welfare system, and I found that very challenging because a lot of ladies that have been um, in and out of the system and have, um, you know, came from that foster system, it looks different because they're so used to coming from families where they're being sexual assaulted also. And so um, it's just very challenging with running the program. But I'll let Mahogany um, take over from here and say her spiel because I am recovering from a surgery. So I'm kind of getting a spiel here. So I'm going to let her step in and I'm going to go and bring myself back to part. Hey, everyone. My name is Mahogany Tony, and I'm a young outreach specialist for women living with HIV. Um, some of the oppressions and uh, systematic things that I face as a young black trans woman are, I used to work in like the spaces of where I was misgendered, I was discriminated against, and I was just treated poorly. Every time I would go out in public and things like that, you know, we as black trans women, we face so much hate and discrimination. And I think with people of the young LGBT community, they face so much oppression from their family members, whether it's society, whether it's discrimination on jobs in these spaces with cisgender heterosexual people, that they feel like, you know, we don't have anywhere to turn and, you know, there's nothing else to do but, you know, do crime and sex work and you're forced to do that because you feel like you're so closed up, you're so bottled up, like there's nothing else to turn to. like. What do you do? You know, so that's why I feel as though a lot of the LGBTQ community, young youth are incarcerated in welfare systems and different things of that nature just because of all the systematic oppression that we face. And there's nowhere to turn to for help. We, we're a young, as a young woman living with HIV, before I found my amazing executive director there, Nisha, I didn't know any resources to go to for you know, health benefits or resources to help me. I lost my job. I didn't have any, you know, funds. You know, we have crisis funds and it's just so many amazing things going on at Tate. But a lot of people in the black community, just black, being black is a struggle within itself. You know, you don't have anywhere to go. You don't have any resources to turn to. No one's out here trying to help you. No one's out here, you know, trying to say, okay, you black, you're trans. We want to stand for you. You don't get that, you know, especially here in Birmingham, where it's so racist and so discriminative against not only black people, but black trans people of the LGBTQ community. And I thank you, Nisha, because she's so amazing and she's fighting for black young trans women, not only young trans women, but trans women of, of a broader spectrum. And it's just so many great things going on here. It's, it's just so amazing. Now, I think I know what I have to, I got to take it kind of slow because this is my first time being long-winded, and so it kind of took my breath away from me. So, um, we can talk about the challenges that we face here. Of course, we know the biggest challenge with running any organization is, you know, the funding. Um, people look at us for being in the deep south. 
um, the Angelica Christian background, conservative, um, red state that, you know, there's no work that's being done here. I can tell you that Take is doing some amazing work from the, the small budget that we have, like Mahogany said about the crisis fund. I felt that it was very critical to um, get the crisis fund up and running due to the fact that, you know, these ladies have needs that needs to be met and we got to be able to meet their needs. But how could we meet their needs if we don't have the money to help them. So every time that I got a, a funding source or a pool of money to come in, I would pinch, you know, a thousand dollars from there and kept building this pool of crisis money. So I can say, well, uh, ladies, this is what we have available to assist you with crisis funds. And um, to be able to have the opportunity around the challenges that we um, face um, dealing with the municipal court, of course, all the paperwork is dated back to Jim Crow's laws and stuff. They don't understand what this trans thing looks like, that, so they say, you know, and I'm trying to get them to understand that being trans is simply a human being. How do you treat a human being with dignity and respect? That's the only thing that we look for from y'all. They, um, they don't have any paperwork there that specifically um, that does not stick you to a specific gender. It's either, you know, male or female, no other way. So we happen them with those um, challenges that they're having with the court system. Also with the ladies that don't have legal name changes, um, it's a battle with that too. They noticed that it was so many um, transgender individuals that was getting name changes here in Birmingham. When I got my name changed back um, 15 years ago, I only paid, you know, a total of $12. Now, you know, 15 years later, we got them charging us almost $83 and you got to wait almost a year and a half to get a name change. You know, so it's just different systematic oppressors that they're setting up along the way because they see that it's more and more people that are coming out and being true to themselves and identifying as trans. So it's very, you know, critical that the work that take is doing that we're getting the support that we, you know, get because we're taking care of very vulnerable population. Right now, we got um, three ladies that are actually in the reentry program that are just now coming out of prison, you know, formerly incarcerated, and they don't know where to start. You know, prison have really broken them down where they're just fearful to be out in public and to be seen, you know, where they probably been locked in prison eight and nine years where trans was not not a big conversation or we wasn't as visible and then to get out and see that we're visible and we get murdered every day they just like you know oh maybe i should have stayed in there and then i won't have to worry about getting murdered and i'm like no it's a better way out and let us help you work through that so i think the programming here is very good and i'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to be a part of this presentation today Thank you so much, Daranisha. And we'll have a chance, everyone, to come back around with a series of questions and comments. But I just want to thank you, Mahogany, for taking time out to share your personal experience as a young person who's advocating amongst other young people um, and who desperately need access to medical care and services and don't know where to turn. And fortunately, they, they have you to help, help them figure it out and how to navigate some of that, right? Um, Awesome. So we're going to turn uh, to um, Colette Carter, the executive director of Breakout. We're so happy Breakout could be with us today. We weren't sure it was going to happen, but um, Colette made the save. And so we're super excited that you're here, Colette. So um, we don't have a PowerPoint, but we're just going to pass the mic to you to share a little bit about the phenomenal work that um, Breakout's been doing in New Orleans. Take it away, Colette. Hi, um, so lovely to be here with all of you. And yes, I definitely apologize. We were not sure we were going to make it. Um, <laughs> but um, excited to share and also be um, a part of this discussion because it's very few places that we get to sit down and talk a lot about what that actually means in a space that can shift things. And I think both Chris and both folks, both of the ladies from Alabama spoke beautifully to exactly what I, I have actually heard a lot from community and have experienced here at Breakout. So just to talk a little bit about Breakout and our work. So Breakout is a youth organization 
located in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, we service youth 13 to 25, LGBTQ youth here in New Orleans. Um, in addition to um, having community organizing campaigns. So to talk about the service side, we have a POSH program, which helps people um, get their high school equivalency. Um, what used to be known as the GED, which runs from Tuesday to Thursdays that folks access weekly, in addition to three different um, organizing committees. One is healing and resistance together, where folks kind of strategize around um, community-led ways um, that we can hold harm and hold each other. Um, the Vice to ICE Committee, which works on uh, the intersection of immigration and LGBTQ youth, and also the We Deserve Better Committee, which is our oldest campaign, which is the Breakouts First campaign um, around jobs, education, and housing. Um, so in addition to the programming, what I would probably just add to um, that Darinisha and Chris and folks Mahogany said is that I think one of the ways um, that I just want to kind of call out and highlight that often happens is that our youth are kind of swept up in a way for just defending themselves, right? Um, and this happens in many different ways. Um, like part of the reason why I think we were a little over capacity even about getting on this call is we kind of underestimated the start of the school year, which in a youth organization, that is one thing, but also for our LGBTQ youth youth members, um, it may be the start of them finding new community, they're falling in love, parents are finding letters, people are getting kicked out. Um, it, so it means something in a way where it could lead to people having to defend themselves in schools. And then um, particularly here in Louisiana, which our education system was reconfigured. Um, and I will own and say that I am new to New Orleans. So I've heard some people say our education system was dismantled. I've heard some people say our education here system was retooled, but we are now basically primarily charter schools. There are very few public schools left, which has left a terrain where most schools have absolute authority around their policies, which again, is an opportunity for us that we have been taking advantage of through trainings and even framing um, the fact, the even framing the training around safety of LGBTQ youth around it is self-defense because there's an intersection of harm that folks are um, experiencing just for trying to either make money to have have their daily needs met or um, actually survive um, harassment and or violence. Um, and I think the other big part of that um, that I would add to um, for us is that working in partnership and having the funding to work in partnership with other places has also been critical for um, at least providing a way to get access to resources for youth. So for instance, um, we've done trainings for like the large um, youth homeless shelter here in town, which is a covenant house, which you know, it's a large organization, big machine back funded, and has some very in real problems. And so between the partnership and the trainings, um, at least we know we have a place in town that if a youth is wanting to work themselves out of the system or out of the group homes, that, you know, that Covenant House will not turn anyone away. And we can call, our organization can call and get people in there at any hour of the night. Um, because we want to be able to provide our youth with opportunities and choices, particularly when they're coming from the foster care system and they're a ward of the state, and to provide ways to advocate for them healthcare-wise or in-school-wise, even if it's about the names that uh, gets announced when they cross the stage, if they decide to stay or if they're able to maintain education or not through our program, um, and um, to always um, provide a way to develop their leadership to continue for them to become advocates and create what sort of policies they wanna see in their individual kind of schools or in their places where they have to receive uh, benefits, the foster care system. Great, thank you so much, Colette, for sharing a little bit about Breakout's work. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna remind everybody to go ahead and chat in your questions into the chat box um, so that we can start getting those lined up so now we're going to turn to, um, to Lyle 
from Funders for LGBTQ Issues. And Lal, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the work of Funders for LGBTQ Issues and in general, provide us like a, a overview of what does funding look like for LGBTQ organizations? Um, what are some of the challenges that these organizations face in accessing the resources they need to sustain their work? And also, what are some of the different roles potentially that uh, pooled funds or intermediaries can play to help uh, develop and support the landscape of these organizations? So welcome. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Manuel. And thank you to Leticia and Andrew's Family Fund for pulling us all together. Um, and what an honor to be included with people like Alexandria, Chris, uh, Derenisha, Mahogany, and Colette. This is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to chat with you all. And thank you all for being here today. Um, and it's funny, because as I was asked to do this, I was thinking back, you know, when I started in LGBTQ philanthropy nearly a decade ago now, um, I was considered an LGBTQ youth, and I certainly am not anymore. So um, it's great to be here and be talking about an issue that is still really important. Um, and sadly, that hasn't evolved as much as I'd like to see it uh, evolve in my tenure in LGBTQ philanthropy. Um, so I just want to start by giving you all some background on funders for LGBTQ issues for those of you that are newer to us as an organization. Um, so we are a philanthropy serving organization that really exists to increase philanthropic resources for LGBTQ communities. We are a membership of over 80 uh, foundations uh, that annually award more than $1 billion, more than 100 million of which goes to LGBTQ issues. And we really focus on three key activities to increase philanthropic resources for the field. We focus on convening and collective action. So we work with the current grant makers that are supporting our communities to help them connect with one another, learn from each other, coordinate their efforts and maximize their impact. Um, the second thing we do is we do outreach and uh, offer support services. So we strategically target foundations where we think there's a case to be made that they should or could be supporting our LGBTQ communities. Um, but they might not yet. For example, foundations that are heavily invested in racial justice or other social justice endeavors. And we offer them the support services to make their first LGBTQ grant. Um, the last thing we do, which is where I sit, is we do research and communication. So I'm our director of research and communications. We annually publish a tracking report that looks at trends, gaps, and opportunities related to LGBTQ grant making. And we use that research and, and we strategically communicate about it to uh, aid in our convening and collective action and in our outreach and support service. So everything kind of works together. Um, and as we look at the next slide, uh, anyone who is familiar with our organization would be well familiar with this slide by this point. Um, this looks at our tracking endeavors uh, going back more than 40 years back to 1973 when foundation funding for LGBTQ issues was just about $14,000, all the way up to our latest research efforts in 2016. Um, and you'll see that there's been a pretty steady increase with a, a few setbacks, you know, most notably a setback around the Great Recession. It's been a pretty gradual increase. Um, and, and in fact, in 2016, for the first time, we surpassed $200 million for LGBTQ issues, um, which is pretty substantial. I will note that we do have a, uh, a, a slight line there that distinguishes two different totals for 2016. And that's because for those of you that, would, uh, that are familiar and remember, 2016 was the year of the Pulse nightclub massacre. So there was a substantial philanthropic response to that massacre. Um, there was about $29.5 million that was provided in direct financial support for the survivors and the families of the victims. Um, and, and while that's important to capture, and that's in some ways an encouraging sign of where philanthropy is moving with LGBTQ communities, that funding itself is extremely um, limited in both its time and scope. So we want to denote that. But even if you were to take that away, we're looking at about $170 million annually. And even in the last 10 years, from 2007 to 2016, uh, that's more than doubling. You're going from about nearly 60 million or 60 million or so in um, 2007 to 170 million in um, uh, 2016, which is great progress. However, as we look at the next slide, one of the things that, um, that I think that we need to keep in mind as we think about this progress is, so $200 million sounds like a lot of money, right? But if we think about this in relation to philanthropy overall, it's really not that much money. When you're talking about you know, annual giving from US foundations hovering somewhere between 55 and $60 mil billion, what that really means is that for every $100 awarded by US foundations, only 34 cents goes to LGBTQ communities. And it's only 29 cents if you exclude that philanthropic response from the One Orlando Fund 
for the survivors and the uh, families of the victims of the Pulse nightclub massacre. So it's really only roughly about, you know, it's, it's, and it's only actually this year that we exceeded a quarter um, for every $100 that, uh, that LGBTQ communities are receiving. And so when you put that $200 million in that perspective, you know, there's a case to be made that there certainly is room for more funding for our communities. Um, and while that upward trajectory has been really positive, that upward trajectory has not been uniform. And as we look at the next slide, um, what we'll see is that actually when we're talking about LGBTQ uh, children and youth, over the last four years, the funding has been decreasing. So while overall the funding has been increasing, when we talk about um, LGBTQ children and youth, which by the way, are the most funded uh, population under LGBTQ people. They are also the most funded subpopulation by foundations in general. Um, but we looked at, we saw a peak in uh, 2013 of about 25 million, where we were at about 20 million in 2016. Um, and so it remains to be seen if this uh, decline is going to continue to progress further or if, if we're leveling out or if we're gonna go back up. But it's, it's a slightly alarming trend when we see some other trends in other areas where the funding has continued to increase. Um, and it's something that we definitely uh, have noted at funders for LGBTQ issues. And that I think that, you know, certainly I'm sure a lot of the organizations uh, that are on the phone today can attest to feeling um, and that, you know, hopefully some funders will start paying attention to. Um, if we look at the next slide, uh, we can see kind of who, who's playing in the space, right? Over the last two years, who have been the top 10 funders of LGBTQ children and youth? Um, and, and, you'll, and what's notable about this is, so, you know, we do our tracking report, we survey thousands of foundations. Every year we find between 350 and 400 foundations that award grants to LGBTQ communities. And what I find fascinating is that um, children and youth actually has a lot more foundations supporting it than other groups. About 200, and we identified in the last two years, 214 foundations that were supporting LGBTQ children and youth, which doesn't sound like a lot, but relative to a lot of the other issue areas and populations that we track funding for, it's actually a pretty good spread. Um, but what we do find is that similar to LGBTQ funding in general, it still is really top heavy, right? So these top 10 foundations listed here account for 60% of the funding. Um, these top 10 foundations are also the only 10 foundations that in two years, the two years cumulatively awarded a million dollars or more to support LGBTQ children and youth. And again, when I, you know, um, when I think about the challenges that I know of, when I think about the challenges that I've heard today on the call, I mean, I think that's a question is, is that enough? Um, and it's something that we really need to ask ourselves. But as you look at the list, you know, this is a nice mix of both um, LGBTQ and non LGBTQ foundations. And surprisingly enough, a nice mix of some, you know, local community foundations, which we think is really important to invest in local communities. Uh, you know, more than half of um, funding for LGBTQ children and youth goes uh, to the local level to work at the local level, which is important. So it's nice to see groups like Community Foundation for Northeast Florida, um, and the New York Women's Foundation show up. Um, and as we go to the next slide, we can see kind of who are some of the top grant recipients for LGBTQ children and youth funding. Um, and I know Manuel was asking about the grant recipients, so I'll try and focus some more comments on that. But this just gives you a snapshot of who in the uh, last two years has received funding. And uh, there is one caveat I wanna give about this um, because you know even these groups that look like they have a lot of funding, um, you know they're still operating on small budgets when we consider these groups to national, you know, children and youth serving organizations. And the other thing is this does capture multi-year grant making all in one year that it was awarded. So this might actually be more than an organization's annual budget, but that's because they might have, for example, there is one large group on here that received a multi-year grant from Ford, but it was all captured in one year, in the year that it was awarded. And that's just the way that our taxonomy works. So I want to note that for groups. And um, actually, as I was doing this, number 11 would have been breakout um, which was exciting to see uh, someone on the call would be fe featured here. But this gives you an idea of some of the mix of who's in the current grant recipients for funding for LGBTQ children and youth. Um, what is kind of interesting to me, and I, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily get it by looking at this list of particular grantees, as a lot of these are LGBTQ specific, but in the last 10 years, uh, only 65% of the funding went to LGBTQ specific organizations and 35% went to non-LGBTQ specific organizations that were doing LGBTQ work. And, you know, as an organization, we don't officially have an opinion on that, but it's, it's, it's a trend worth noting, right? It's a trend that we have seen in national funding right now, the national funding in the last year in 2016, it was the highest, it was 25% went to non-LGBTQ organizations. And, you know, that was something that we wanted to note because while we encourage cultural competency, 
um, at mainstream service providers and mainstream organizations, it's obviously really important too that we preserve LGBTQ organizations and the knowledge and connections to community that they have. Um, so that was something I wanted to point out. You know, all of these grant recipients ended up receiving in the last two years more than 1,500 grants, um, which is a good chunk of grants. Uh, and the median grant size was $7,500. Um, just so that folks that are on the phone can think about that and what that would mean for their organization and how that might be relatively low to some of the size of grants that larger uh, philanthropic organizations are um, supporting. Um, as we look at the next slide, we can kind of see um, where the funding has fluctuated over the last five years um, by some of the, by the top four sub issues addressed in um, funding for LGBTQ children and youth. So the top for uh, areas of funding that we looked at uh, that we were able to identify were community building and empowerment, criminalization and criminal justice reform, education and safe schools, and housing and homelessness. And this nicely kind of dovetailed onto the topic that we were trying to talk about today and some of the issue areas that I know Andrew's Family Fund is interested in. Um, you'll see that it's been pretty even uh, and pretty steady for community building and empowerment, which is good on the one hand, but on the other hand, as I said, you know, we've seen LGBTQ funding increasing, right? Um, we've seen philanthropy in general increasing. And so when something holds steady, you have to wonder why it isn't increasing. Um, it was nice to see a pretty uh, steady increase for funding for LGBTQ youth in criminalization and criminal justice reform efforts. Uh, there was a slight drop off in 2016. And I will note that um, it wasn't that there wasn't any funding in 2012 that would have been captured under general civil rights. That was 2013 was the first year we broke that out as an issue or when we started seeing a, a good chunk of funding specifically devoted to criminal and criminal justice reform efforts. Um, education and safe schools has fluctuated quite a bit. A, a good portion of that is likely due to the impact of multi-year grant making. Um, but again, you'll see that flux. And uh, encouragingly, you know, funding for LGBTQ children and youth around housing and homelessness has been steadily increasing. Um, as we look at the next slide, I did also just want to point out some of the populations that we've been talking about on the call and where that funding has been. You know, it's been really encouraging to see overall in, when we think about LGBTQ philanthropy in general, funding for trans communities has had a really, really encouraging growth trajectory. Um, unfortunately, funding for communities of colors has not. Um, it's been static, if not decreasing, um, and that's a cause for concern. And we see a little bit of that mirrored here when we look at uh, grant making to support LGBTQ children and youth by select populations. We see that uh, funding for uh, trans youth has been increasing, um, and funding for youth of color has been more static, if not fluctuating and, and having a trend of decreasing up until 2016. Um, some other things that, you know, I just wanted to uh, highlight is that I think is important for our conversations here is, you know, as we think about this funding, and I think about some of the great groups that we heard from today, um, I'm sure a lot of them would benefit from general operating support. You know, we hear a lot about the nimble responses uh, and the nimble work that they're having to do on behalf of their constituencies and to further the issues that, that we all care about. Um, and yet, currently 60% of all grant making support LGBTQ children and youth is program support. Um, so that's something to consider for grant makers on the phone. The other thing just to think about is that, you know, as I mentioned, you know, more than half is local. Um, and this local work is more evenly dispersed than a lot of other funding that we see. It, it, it currently covers 44 states in the country. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's covered evenly. Um, there are five states that receive more than a million dollars in funding. Uh, New York State received 7.3 million, California 6 million, Florida 2.6 million, Illinois 1.6 million, and Minnesota 1 million. Um, and then there are a lot of states that receive next to nothing, right? Alaska received $500 over two years. Um, Delaware received $2,500 over two years. So it's, it's really not evenly distributed. And, and, there's a, and so while in some ways this is a really um, sad picture to paint, um, I like to be, I'm an internal optimist and I like to look at the sunny side of things. And the great thing is there's a lot of opportunities for funders on the call to really dive in and make a big difference. I mean, as you saw from the top 10 list, it wouldn't take a lot of money to get you into the top 10 list over two years um, pretty rapidly. Um, so I think that's encouraging. And I think, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. I want to answer your question too, Manuel, about funder collaborators. There are opportunities for this. Uh, I was fortunate enough to sit on the uh, Queer Youth Fund. Um, which I don't know if anyone is familiar with, but that was a fund that was housed at the Liberty Hill Foundation that was a collaborative fund. Um, we awarded uh, $100,000 grants to innovative uh, LGBTQ youth projects throughout the country. And sadly, that fund no longer exists. It, it awarded more than $5 million in its, in its time, um, but it no longer exists. And there's certainly a hole there 
um, in my opinion at least, for being able to fund really innovative cutting edge youth work that won't get funded elsewhere, right? That isn't gonna get funded from the big mainstream foundations that are a little bit more risk averse. So I think there's certainly an opportunity there um, and I look forward to seeing how the field re responds. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to leave you all with um, is obviously, I know we're gonna have some questions and answer time now. I also wanted to say, I, I was not smart enough to add a slide with my own contact information and everything like that, but I am happy to be a resource to anyone on this call and uh, to provide my email to Manuela and to everyone. I guess I can chat it after this. Um, and another thing is, as we're thinking about statistics, um, there is, there is, as uh, Alexandria pointed out, um, or as Alexandra pointed out, there is a dearth of research on this, but there's been a really smart publication that came out in the last year from Chapin Hall um, around um, LGBTQ youth in, in foster care and in um, LGBTQ homeless youth. Um, and I would encourage you all to take a look at that. And again, I was not on top of it enough to uh, send this manual to send up before, but I'd be happy to share it with anyone who's interested. Um, so thank you, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much, Lyle. That's really helpful. And I wanted to give um, Marco Quiroga from the Contigo Fund, who happened to be on the line joining us as a participant, the opportunity to share a reflection or two, Marco, based on some of the data that Lyle shared, given that um, uh, Contigo was started after the Pulse Massacre and that Florida, according to the data that Lyle shared, is the third um, highest ranking in terms of the amount of monies being received. Uh, for LGBTQ youth, uh, does that signal to you a plethora of resources? Like what is, what do you th think is um, happening in terms of the work you've been doing uh, as a donor collaborative to support LGBTQ uh, organizations? All right, thank you so much, Manuela. Can, can you all hear me? All right, all right, great. Um, yeah, I, I just would want to, I think, thank Lyle for all of his observations. Um, one of the biggest things that Lyle pointed out is the response to the Pulse Massacre and how limited it was in terms of its uh, purpose and its, its scope and its time. And so prior to the tragedy, um, we did a community needs assessment alongside funders for LGBTQ issues uh, to try to get to uh, the root causes of what what the disparities were that we were seeing after the tragedy, which we knew were historic in nature and deeply rooted in the communities that were most affected, which were LGBTQ, um, youth, LGBTQ youth, uh, uh, people of color, um, and individuals uh, from those communities uh, told us that there was a history of gaps in leadership. Um, nonprofits that we spoke to told us that there was gaps in resources. There's uh, individuals who are working in silos, but also competing because uh, there is just uh, so, so much to do and so little um, resources to actually support the work needed to be done. And there was a gap in, uh, in the people who represented the most um, hardest to reach communities and places to, of leadership within those uh, organizations to kind of be self-determinant in, uh, in kind of the outcomes of what these organizations were trying to do. And so um, the, the support that uh, resulted from the Pulse Massacre was really much uh, a international outpouring of support um, that really directly went to the victims' families and the survivors. So the 30 million that, he spot, that Lyle spotlighted went to that. And then there was a, a coalition of foundations that knew that this was gonna be the case. Um, they covered, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, um, led um, by the Arcus Foundation and uh, about five other foundations nationally. And uh, they covered all the administrative costs of the National Center for Victims of Crime so that all the dollars that would be raised in the immediate aftermath would go to the survivors and the families. But then in addition to that, they pulled together some dollars uh, to respond to the long-term needs of the community. And so what, what we learned after that is that um, funders need to be very vigilant that when crises happen and crises are going to happen over and over again in our communities because our communities are, are at the center of being targeted for violence, bigotry, climate disasters, and so forth. And so uh, we, we have to be vigilant that we're, we don't only have to respond to the, um, the immediate aftermath of a tragedy, but also be vigilant that there's opportunity to really so and cultivate movements that emerge from tragedy and make sure that we're thinking long-term 
into the future of what, what, what this community will look like five years, 10 years down the road. And so we, we've had some great uh, uh, partnerships that we were able to form um, to make sure that we're being responsive, not only to the immediate needs here in the community through Contigo Fund, but also the long-term empowerment of this community so that they can be self-determined to, to talk about exactly what, what this means for them and what they want this to mean in the history of this community going into the future. That's great. Thank you so much, Marco, for volunteering to share a couple of reflections. Um, sorry we put you on the spot, but thank you for being so gracious. Um, I want to kind of talk a little bit. Um, first, remind everybody if you'd like to share um, any questions. This is the time we're moving into our Q&A uh, before we wrap up. So we'd love to hear a little bit about um, any questions you may have based on what the presenters have shared. Uh, any question, any comments around like what are we missing? What have what have we not discussed that you think is very important to bring bring to light? Um, one of the questions I had, I wanted to turn to Chris and talk a little bit. Um, Chris, when we were working on the presentation, you mentioned you know um, some of the major challenges facing organizations and staff on the front lines doing the work and. And Colette uh, referenced this just a little bit as well um, around, you know, the realities of young people are going back to school and they're experiencing uh, a lot of challenges that get in the way of just like, let's say, their own leadership uh, as organizers, potentially. Um, you mentioned, Chris, on our call, you know, this, you classified the LGBTQ movement as an under-resourced movement and uh, said to me, is it possible that this is just too little too late? And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, what you meant by that and, and any um, reflections you might have about, you know, given the urgency that you all laid out and still yet um, the severe lack of resources and even the decline in resources specifically for young people that you mentioned, Lyle, like why is this happening and what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, one, I did want to add some kind of greater context to all of the really great information that Lyle laid out, um, which is that I know LGBT funders has also uh, done studies specifically on funding for trans-led organizations. Um, and so I, I think that's also an important part of this context as we're talking about LGBT young people, um, you know, particularly LGBT young people who face um, incarceration, who are in foster care and in juvenile facilities. and of which uh, trans and gender non-conforming, non-binary young people um, are particularly vulnerable and targeted. And that the, the larger reality of the kind of funding landscape for trans work um, is, is very, very bleak, right? I believe the stat that LGBT funders has put out is that 0.15% of foundation funding goes to trans-led organizations, right? So that's like less than 1%. And in my experience as someone who's been in the trans movement for, um, you know, going on 15 years at this point, um, that, that is uh, our reality in a step, right? Um, the reality is that trans-led uh, organizing, trans-led organizations in this country, um, trans leaders have been historically and continue to be under-resourced. Um, continue to have lack of access to opportunities in terms of leadership development, in terms of training. Um, this like overall, I would say, neglect by the broader LGBT movement and broader social justice movement has meant that trans leaders around this country who are really on the front lines and fighting back against these attacks are doing so with, with very, very little, um, as folks on this call have spoke to, very, very little resource um, to move that work. Um, the Trans Justice Funding Project, which I'm sure um, some folks on this call are familiar with, and if not, um, definitely, definitely look them up on the internet. Um, you know, they have been mapping all of the trans organizations around the country. And I think at this point, there's, there's going on 500 trans-led uh, projects and organizations. And I would say, I can count probably on one hand, the number of organizations that have like more, that have more than one paid staff, if any paid staff at all, that have office space, like folks are organizing out of their cars and have been for a, a very, very long time. Um, you know, so in this moment where we are facing such uh, an intense attack 
um, you know, for these trans led organizations around the country. And so, you know, the reality is that they are doing everything, right? I mean, as folks have spoke to, like they're supporting trans young people, they're spoking, supporting trans people incarcerated, they're making sure people have access to healthcare, they're dealing with the ongoing violence and murder that people are facing. Like these organizations are doing everything they can to keep our community safe and to continue to fight for our rights with just very, very little resource um, at their disposal. At their disposal. Um, you know, for example, at TLC, we have a partnership with GSA Network for a project called Truth, which is a trans youth le national um, leadership storytelling uh, movement building organization. And you know, that, that project is national, um, but supporting kind of trans leaders on the ground around the country. And, you know, in this moment with this group of like 30 young people, we've, we've seen the real impacts that this has had. Like folks are literally like dealing with the suicides of other folks in their community, you know, dealing with their own mental health issues, dealing with lack of access to healthcare. And at the same time, um, speaking out and being visible against the injustice that they're facing, which has always, and then even more so in this moment, actually put them in, um, in even un more uh, unsafe conditions, right? Because of the right wing um, extremism that we're seeing because of the ways in which under this new administration, uh, people are more emboldened than before to be hateful, um, to be violent. Um, so we're seeing with the ways in which uh, for, for trans youth leaders um, who are speaking out that even more so than be before, folks are uh, vulnerable, um, unsafe, and needing more so than before, um, support and access to resources. And yet, you know, folks are still speaking out, folks are still fighting back, folks are still doing what uh, we all can to keep each other safe. Um, so I did also want to provide that like broader context too, to just, you know, the, the overall historic and ongoing um, under-resourcing of, of trans-led work. Um, and I would say even more so for, for work led by trans young people, um, like folks have spoken to um, at Breakout and Take. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. And I wanted to see, Alexandra, if you could talk a little bit about, a little bit more about some of the opportunities, right? So even though we're seeing, um, you know, Lyle mentioned that 35% of the funding is going to um, organizations that are not necessarily identifying as LGBTQ organizations to serve LGBTQ young people. Um, what are some of the opportunities on the horizon that you see um, either with uh, federal legislation or ways in which child welfare agencies are trying to understand the um, intersection of multiple identities that the young people we care about carry, whether they're immigrant young people, um, whether they identify as LGBTQ, um, what are some of the things that you think could help if we look at servicing the youth we care about from across multiple systems, from policy to organizing to advocacy to legislation? What, what, what are some of the ways that you've seen that you see that brewing now? I don't know if you're still on the line. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you might. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was on mute. Thank you. Um, that that's a really good question. It's a really big question. You know, I think CSSP sits in a couple of different spaces here. We do work on immigration. We uh, do a lot of work, obviously, around uh, youth of color, families of color, and we also do work around LGBTQ youth. So we have the uh, the experience of being to take apply that intersectional lens across our work and taking that lens to the child welfare systems that we work in explicitly. Um, and I think it, it, there's a really, there's an opportunity within Family First as states begin to build out their continuum of prevention services, as well as reorganize their, um, their family foster homes and congregate care and foster care continuum as well, to really uh, take a, a deeper look at the needs of youth in their system and the needs of families in their communities to really understand who, who is not currently being served, right? So we know that LGBTQ youth and LGBTQ youth of color in particular experience disparate outcomes. They're more likely to um, age out to homelessness. Um, and we heard a little bit about that today as well. So really thinking about 
who is not being served by the way, by the current structure of your system and of child welfare systems to identify those gaps because now there really is an opportunity to target and provide um, holistic services in those areas. Um, but if systems continue to parse people out into different pieces of their identity, um, we're really going to be missing that opportunity to more broadly support children and youth and, and families. Um, so I think that that's, that's a big opportunity, but it is one that will take a lot of work. Um, I think that child welfare systems aren't necessarily designed right to be looking in these to see who their system isn't exactly working for. Um, so as advocates and as folks who are providing TA and folks who are providing funding to these systems, to really encourage them to say, well, let's look at who you're not serving right now. Who is your system not working for? And what, what can we do um, in those spaces uh, is really important. Um, and we have an opportunity um, now to do that, particularly in child welfare. That's great. And, you know, I want, I was wondering if maybe um, Tara Nisha or Mahogany, if you could share your reflections on what are some of the ways that um, funders or other community uh, organizations can continue to support the developing leadership of trans or queer youth of color in organizing. Um, at Colette, also, if you wanted to chime in on this as well. Um, I, I remember during our planning call, Chris mentioned that um, this field as an emerging field for organ, like just the structure of like nonprofits and organizations and this idea of like having in-house seasoned long-term leadership of LGBTQ and trans youth, that that looks different in this issue area versus potentially other social justice uh, movement issues. So I um, would love to hear from anybody about what are some of the ways that either funders or other colleagues can better understand and support collaboration, solidarity, and partnership with your young people and your organizations. Feel free, Darren, you share, Colette. Um, okay, we got another system going here where we can hear better out there. But um, I think that um, the most critical thing, like I said, is about making sure that the resources around the funding, because as we look at it in the philanthropy world, like all the, um, the funding streams are set up to go out towards these big ASOs and CDOs. And I came back in just as Chris was saying, you know, how that we are underserved. And I just think about creating take um, when I created Take, I created Take from doing sex work, you know. So I went out, I, you know, sold my body to not only survive, but to take care of my ladies that needed, you know, a hotel room for the night, that needed food, that, you know, needed whatever they need. I tried to make sure that I was taking care of their needs by, you know, hustling my body and trying to survive as well. Um, run and take with no staff, me, you know, doing the work um, and the, the leadership development wasn't there for me because, of course, this was something different. Um, of course, when it comes to fundraising and soliciting, yeah, I can relate to that because that was a part of my um, sex work role. But when it comes to, you know, writing a grant and, you know, getting in a full proposal, or LOI and all that stuff, that was, you know, not familiar to me. And I just experienced something recently where I was um, sending in a proposal for a grant, well, the full proposal, and the LOI was very, you know, lenient, but the full proposal was very intense, and it sent me into a very overwhelming stage, and it made me feel like that, you know, I'm not going to be successful at this, because the way that this philanthropy world is set up, it's set up for us to fail. So if I, I don't have experience in grant writing, how do I, you know, get this 10 to 14 page grant in 
you know, outside of me really just doing the work and most of my time is being devoted to life experience and what I have encountered as a trans woman of color and what I see that's going on every day in the lives of the people that I'm serving. But these applications ain't reflecting, you know, just what we're doing and what life experience, you know, have given us. This, these applications want more in detail, more data and all these things. And I think I talked last on the last call about, um, I think that the funders should already have, they said that they want to serve our population. So the funders should already have the necessary data and the necessary information that they would need to go out and put funding in the community. But when you come in, you expect us to provide you with all that information. Then on top of the work that we're doing, it makes it more frustrating because especially when you're working with just you know, a three to four person staff and we're trying to serve, you know, 40 plus people um, in case management and then running a um, drop in space and making sure that the clothing closet is stocked and all this stuff. So, and people are not working full time hours. So I think those would be two um, ways that we can look at um, how they can support us better, making sure that the the, um, the funds are getting actually to grassroots organizations and community-based organizations that are founded and led by the people that they want to target as population. And also finding out is it a way that um, the application process can be more simplified where we won't have to sit up here and, you know, how to you write over a 15 page book just to get some money for things that we know that it needs to be done but then you got an organization that is very experienced and they got a grant writing person on staff and so they're not doing the work but they're easily to get the money but then we're struggling to survive or we're struggling to get a paycheck trying to take care of our own community. Thank you, Daranisha. And I wanted to turn to um, Colette and see if you had any reflections. But before, right, right before then, Colette, I just want to give a shout out to Anna Janeri, who's on the line and is um, one of the uh, or, uh, leaders and organizers with um, Foster Youth in Action that has been working to build the leadership of young people who are in the foster care system. And I went to their national. Um, action last year and saw a few youth who were LGBTQ identified and just navigating the space of like building the leadership and developing organizing as a strategy uh, of young people that are in direct service agencies. So um, Anna, feel free to chime in anytime. But Colette, you have the closing, um, the closing words for, for our uh, learning session. Um, so I guess what I would like to say, I, I would definitely like to double down on what Darren Isha brought forth, like dedicated multi-year funding that is based on kind of seeding a field and, 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 and building and investing in, in leadership. Like I know a lot of foundations like, like to give to a lot of the bigger machines and that moves a lot of policy work too, but having a dedicated portion that is just gonna give you a return because it's actually gonna give a chance for folks. Like again, 500 uh, in, in, in the number, how many of them serve youth? How many of them are youth organizations? Like there's plenty of room for the seating. Um, and um, I think I would also add that, for adding on to the red state perspective, the reason why I'm saying multi-year is, uh, and a good example of that is that, um, particularly when you're talking about red state, the backlash and the backdoor room meetings and handlings um, often happen very quickly and very fastly. And a very tiny example of that is as a part of a consent decree that was passed in New Orleans with a lot of um, work from a lot of different organizations, um, in addition to breakout, uh, we got a consent decree kind of passed basically saying that New Orleans wasn't meeting human rights or wasn't meeting basic human rights. And particularly for LGBTQ youth, we got it um, around um, a standard operating procedure for the police, which is actually one of the most advanced in the country. And it was passed in 2017, the year after the election. And we were also told not to publicize it because we were also not set up at that point to actually engage in a long-term struggle over our win, which was basically promised to us. 
if we had done, you know, press releases and the whole things. So the way that we rolled that out was we let people know that as a part of that consent decree, people were, at a, we had a breakout issue ID, which was supposed to be considered actual picture worthy ID, like a driver's license in New Orleans. And so we would just tell people to come in and get their ID and we would tell them like that. But multi-year funding in a red state is necessary because the fight is real. Thank you, Colette. And I would just want to thank all of our speakers for joining us today. This barely scratches the surface about all of the uh, challenges and opportunities for the work that's happening, uh, impacting LGBTQ youth nationally. Thank you for your work. Everybody just want to encourage you to click on the survey link and briefly comment. This is the fourth learning session. AFF will likely do one more this year. Um, and your feedback really matters and helps inform how we organize these and try to assess whether this is having any impact on uh, promoting the work of our partners and some of the great things that they've learned about how to do the best work in community. So please do fill out that survey. Let us know how are we doing? Is this helpful to you? Um, also, I just want to um, share the screen. Jen is sharing the screen. Take down these emails, click on these organizations, websites, join their mailing list. Um, as Chris so eloquently mentioned, you know, the, we're, the communities that um, are in grave need of support are also immigrant communities, are also people of color communities, are also our artist communities. They are everywhere. So they're more than just um, their um, gender orientation um, or their sexual orientation, their gender identity. They are our families. We are all these communities. And so we really need folks to take a long, hard look at their portfolios and ask yourself the hard question, are you investing for our young people in this space? So thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a beautiful rest of the afternoon and we look forward to seeing you on our Puerto Rico learning session, September 26th, and for our grantee partners in San Juan on the beach, doing hard work, but taking care of ourselves. So we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Ciao.